All right, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't believe it if I told you, but it's true. You hit the play button on yet another... Kevin, another avid episode of V8 Radio. Ooh, avid. I like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means... That means having or showing a keen interest in, or enthusiasm for something. Nice. Like an avid yeah, golfer. Man. Yes, exactly. An well, avid podcast listener. Well, hopefully you're an avid car and enthusiastic uh, aficionado. And All you day. enjoy this kind of nonsense because you've tuned into the VA Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined as always by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball clark and I'm feeling very avid today. Yeah, you sound like it. How about it? <laughs> yeah. Avid is only a couple letters away from a verse, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's, and, true. that's and, true. And not like a rhyme. We're walking a, a, a thin line there. That's right. And uh, the other thin line we walk is the one that tiptoes into the world of automotive <laughs> trivia, which uh, for those who listen to every episode who, uh, you know, is everybody, right? Uh, they know that the beginning of every episode of this podcast, we start off with an automotive trivia question. We throw the question out at the front half, and uh, we make you sit glued to the podcasting device all the way through to the end, uh, where we reveal the answers, and then, man, everything is just so much nicer in the world. It is. It's blue skies in the middle of the night. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So... Yeah. For our avid trivia fanatics, have you uh, prepared a question this episode? Certainly, certainly, certainly. So, Kevin, so last episode, uh, if you, if our listeners recall, you asked me what a mighty Mike was. Oh, right, I did. You did. So I'm going to ask you, what is a gentleman Jim? A gentleman Jim. Mm. A gentleman Jim is, uh, it, it came out before the mighty Mike. And it is another one of those specialty truck packages. It's an option package, but this one on a GMC Jimmy. Um, actually, a GMC pickup truck, but the GM, you know, spells Jim, so they call them Gentleman Jim. And it was uh, an appearance package and some luxury seats and, you know, a few things like that. There was things, you know, Dodge had the little Red Express truck and the Warlock for high-performance mm -hmm. versions. The Warlock's the rare one. That was the... The Plymouth, I think. But the real weird one was the Canadian, uh, which was a a Dodge Dude. <laughs> you ever see one of those? Dodge Dude? <laughs> yeah. Nice. It's I think it, and it's it's like a Fargo truck. It's Canadian. And our friend Cliff Ganan has one. Does he? Yeah. Right on Cliff. Yeah. So anyway, that I that's what has the, any I wonder if it has any duckles on it. <laughs> it's got <laughs> deckles by the shekels. Um, so anyway, the, the Gentleman Jim is a, uh, a GMC pickup truck. I think they were black with gold trim on them maybe or something along those lines. And uh, that, that's my guess. Okay. Uh, how about a bonus, if you're correct? What, uh, what years were, was it available? I want to say it was a... A square body style, like 73, 4, somewhere around there. I don't think it got into the later disco versions, you know, 78, 9, and I don't think it was an earlier body style. So I'm going to say like 73, 4, somewhere around there. I could be wrong on that, but that's just the bonus. Correct. That, as in, it is just the bonus. Well, okay. you know, which means... It's not going to affect the uh, amazing prize I win for all this. Correct. Which is nothing. It will not affect that. <laughs> Assuming I win. <laughs> right on. This is one of the longest standing contests where the winner wins nothing. It's almost like the uh, the German word of the day on the Stubborn German podcast. Yes, also a, uh, a non-prize adventure. but Of which you are a two-time winner. Yeah, by pure luck. Well, pure luck. it's more than anybody else. Uh, well, you know what? I think you might be right. I, I actually came. We, we're trying to flip that one because, see, on this show, we, mm -hmm. we believe in the fairness and enjoyment of equality where each person gets their question and each person gets a chance to answer. The Stubborn German podcast is where the owner of the 
stubborn German brewing company, throws out the question to everybody else and doesn't have to play along. Yeah. But I came up with a really killer one that I would love to turn the tables on. Maybe I'll see if I can work that in next time. Yeah, do that. Chris and Chris Ron, if you're listening, let's change it up a bit. Come on, babe. <laughs> <laughs> he is one of our three listeners, by the way. So, he is. Yeah. He's a good listener. I appreciate that. Uh, and, uh, you know, a couple other shout outs real fast. Uh, um, I've learned that uh, Kelly's got some family that listens to this, so we appreciate that. And right uh, our good longtime friend and listener, Mr. Alex Gerhard, is rocking and rolling on his Cougar engine rebuild. He really, really is. He is going all the way with that engine. He's uh, that is. He's been keep. I've been keeping up with him on that. He's got that at the uh, at the machine shop. The blocks at the machinist. He's he's buying parts. He's he's getting ready, and he, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a real screamer. Yeah, it's gonna be a cool car. I dig those Cougars. Mm-hmm. But right yeah, on it's convertible at that a seventy three Cougar convertible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's totally cool. It's a killer. So uh, keep keep pressing on, Mr. Alex. Appreciate it. All right, so I have uh, prepared a trivia question for you, and it could be I like a slam dunk, super easy one. We'll, we'll find out. Okay. Uh, we're going to dip into your uh, Italian word of the day. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I know. You, you've been to Italy, right? Well, for about an hour. See? <laughs> 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 I try to, you know... <laughs> I try to truncate all my vacations to an hour or yeah. less. Well, it wasn't a vacation. <laughs> yeah. we, were, we were flying back on a mission, and we landed, but we couldn't get off the jet. So, so you were on a, uh, you you were like on American soil. You didn't even go to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, yeah, I guess. And and you were on an airbase, right? Yes, at the uh, Aviano Air Base. So I guess it's Italy. an Italian base. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know how that all shakes out, but. Uh, but during your stay, I'm sure you picked up some choice Italian phrases. Oh, um, for sure. We'll get right to it. What does testarossa mean? Ooh. Ooh. Of course, what referring does to the testarossa uh, mean? famed Ferrari race car and eventually street car of That's the same right. name, the Ferrari Testarossa. Oh, man. <laughs> I freaking hey, know this, too. Ah! This is standard issue first hour Italian lessons, so you've had your first <laughs> yeah, hour. So. Yeah. Oh, for Pete's sake, Michael. Um, By the way, sometimes we, we hear that phrase often. Ah, oh, for Pete's sake, Michael. Who, whose voice is that that we're hearing? <laughs> My mother. <laughs> That's your mother? <laughs> ah, for Pete's it's, sake, Mike. <laughs> in my head. That's exactly what it is. Nice. <laughs> well, cameo appearance by Mama Q there. <laughs> From Q-Ball's mom. <laughs> okay, getting back. Testarossa. Yes. Testarossa. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. gosh. Mm-hmm. Not Ponderosa, mind no. you. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me hungry. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know. Everything's better at the Ponderosa. Test <sighs> Okay. I, I, I don't I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw a whack out there. See Testarossa means race car. Ooh. So let's try, let's try something. Assortistat. Well, God so it doesn't you. work. It doesn't work backwards like race car. Oh. Race car is race car. <laughs> <laughs> <It's Hesterosa. laughs> no. So an Italian that trick doesn't work, but it might be. No, nope. we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> oh, brother, that's a good question too. Gosh darn it! I knew what that meant before. I'm having yeah. just a complete brain fade. I, it may come to me in the middle of the show, but I know it'll be too late. Well, I'll tell you what. If, you, if it does come to you, just feel free to throw it out there. All right. Fair enough. All right. If it just hits you, you, know, you wake up in the middle mm-hmm. of the show and go, hey. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So uh, pretty exciting times all around uh, V8 land 
Um, you and I and, and our buddy <coughs> just got back from a whirlwind tour of the world-class, awesome city of Cleveland. Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you think world-class cities, you think Cleveland. Well, for sure. Cleveland backwards mm. is world-class city. Totally, totally. If you didn't know that. And uh, it was a spur-of-the-moment thing, and our, our buddy kind of planned this. And uh, I, he and I flew out of uh, the St. Louis airport, Lambert Field there, and mm-hmm. didn't, didn't even get a direct flight. We had to stop at Midway, and uh, we get off to go to our next gate. And lo and behold, there's Cue Ball waiting <laughs> How about it, to, right? to join us, a total surprise. So that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we proceeded to go to Cleveland and, and spend three days of pretty intense uh, 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 enjoyment of the uh, culture and the food <laughs> and some fine dining, fine dining and everything from corner bars to tiki bars to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to something on the yeah. 32nd floor and everything in between. So, you know, Cleveland's my hometown and but I left Cleveland when I was 15 years old, I, mm-hmm. I left. Uh, I mean, I grew up in the suburb, but I, I left. I left the the area when I was 15, so I never really got to know it all that well. And this was really fun for me uh, because uh, had worked in the area. He'd go to Cleveland fairly regularly, so he knew a lot of these cool places to visit. So, and that's what we did. And it was neat learning about my own my hometown. And I, yeah. I really appreciated that. I really dug it. And what I really like about Cleveland is, so I grew up in a, in a Chicago suburb, and I was always a big fan of the uh, some of the older cities in the U.S. I, I mean, I guess I'll say east, east of the Mississippi um, cities in the U.S. Sure. And, uh, of course, Chicago has basically a twin in San Francisco. They both grew up at the same time and they've got similar architecture but anyway cleveland uh also has that same kind of look you got you know early skyscrapers and modern right. stuff and everything in between some some things that are like skid owings and marrow and uh right you know mies van der ask glass box type stuff and classical mm-hmm. skyscraper architecture but what it doesn't have is all the stuff that I find annoying in cities, like way too many people and horns honking all the time and people that won't get out of your way and, and people that just suck. So yeah. um, that was really enjoyable. I, I was very impressed, and uh, it, was, it was a very nice place to go visit. It, yeah, it was nice being able to get around the downtown area easily. Yeah. Uh, like you said, yeah, yeah. people not yelling, yelling at you or cars honking at you. Um, we could just, it was it was fairly it, quiet. It was fairly quiet. I mean, yeah. I, I made the remark of I wonder how economically viable all this is, but for for now, I really dig it. Yeah, right. Um, it's a little spooky that it's not super jammed, but I wasn't complaining. Um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was uh, was great. I'd never been there before. Uh, it's a place. Some mm-hmm. places are are like a sanctuary where you you know quietly read and look at the exhibits, and then there's some that are mm-hmm. interactive and and that you crank them up and and you rock out and everything in between. And I'm assuming you felt the same thing I did through that. Absolutely, it, it, I, I'd been to the Rock Hall one time before, but it, it was a few years ago, and it was it was like I hadn't been there before. I mean, I remember a few things, but it's it's so cool to really get down and dirty and look at these artifacts and read about them and really kind of be in the moment with them and say, you know, this is, oh, this is the guitar that Jimi Hendrix played over the watchtower. And this is a 54, uh, uh, Les Paul gold top guitar that, that, uh, somebody played, uh, and Greg, you know, Greg Alma, exactly. And, and it's, it's just guitar. amazing seeing, seeing these things there. I mean, these were the, these are the actual, pieces yeah that's what's so cool about it. it's all authentic it's the stuff mm-hmm. and if it's not if it's a re- reproduction of something they they note it on there they, you know correct but not many it was uh it's no. all legit stuff so that was killer mm-hmm. um and then we got some uh some car guy stuff in we we uh, visited with a good friend of mine mr gary case and uh mm-hmm. gary i met gary and i think about 1997 or eight um gary was the founder of style and concepts and subsequently the sport truck nationals event 
and grew that to be very successful and and then worked with uh at the time it was peterson companies maybe right when the emap company bought peterson uh mm-hmm. and and took over their events so he ran the hot rod power tour and the power festivals and uh, the rod and custom i don't know if it was the americruise at that point um and then a couple of the other off-road stuff and really made those successful events and and uh Gary is a, a Riddler winner from 91. He uh, built a, a 32 Ford that had a like a Boyd chassis and, mm-hmm. you know, the rest of the touches on it. And uh, and then he, he kind of got out of the event deal and started another company uh, called Hot Rod Hardware, which um, I'm sure we've all gotten one of those catalogs along the way, the, the catalogs <laughs> with the neon lights and the bar stools and all the, you know, uh, garage stuff that hot rod guys like uh which right. he eventually sold that to uh, to summit racing so that catalog became part of the summit deal and today uh gary um up until very recently was uh, kind of a partner in a, a shop called street machinery that that builds cars and finds cars and sells cars and he also kind of managed all the cars that went over to the global auto salon and Riyadh. He, he was part of that whole deal. So, um, Gary and I go way, way back and, uh, he's, he's a real good friend and it was real fun to, uh, sit back and, uh, and hang out with Gary in his hometown yeah. of Cleveland. Uh, cause he showed us the world's greatest pastrami sandwich. He did actually it was a corned <laughs> beef sandwich. Yeah. Right. Well, they had both, you know, whatever one you want. Yeah, they did. But my gosh, that was amazing. We have we went to a lunch place called Slimans in in uh, Cleveland, mm-hmm. and I mean, take a note, Carnegie Deli. This place has got it. Holy oh, cats! Yeah. Not messing around. No, not messing around at all. And Gary, that guy is the real deal. Oh yeah, he is, yeah, yeah. He's a hundred percent legit. There's he's one of those guys you can't really tell many stories to because he's already done it himself <laughs> right, twice. The story <laughs> the story might be about him. You know you. Just, <laughs> yeah so or he'll, he'll it, start correcting you no let me tell you how it really went down this is oh, what happened oh, without a yeah. doubt and and yeah. that that's one of the things that's really fun for me is that having worked you know quasi together at some of these companies and knowing a lot of the same people he was at a much higher level than i was i was a you know i, I was a, a peon and he was rubbing elbows with the the, the brass and he was a freelancer, so he didn't have to answer to anybody. You know, he was right. a contractor; he could do or say whatever he wanted. So, to hear a lot of the stories from his perspective, you know, and compare them to the way that I thought they went down or heard they went down back in the day, mm-hmm. to kind of get the real story it was uh, it was a lot of fun. You and you might have been bored out of your mind hearing some of these things, but um, <laughs> not at all. No, I was hanging out of every word. I I loved it. <laughs> It is yeah. so cool to get the you know the legit scoop of of things, especially from you know from the horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and today, um, Gary and uh, and you know the car builder extraordinaire, Mister Bobby Alloway, are putting together an event that's going to happen in September in Nashville called the Triple Crown of Rotting, and the lineage of this event it goes back like forty years in its previous iteration as uh, shades of the past is what it was called. And the shades people decided to, uh, I don't know, they, they came to the end of the, the run for that show, but the location was already there. People were already used to going to Nashville at that time of year. So Alloway and case kind of took it over and, and um, they're turning up the heat on this thing. It is going to be a really cool event. Yeah. And um, it'd be a huge event. Yes, and they're, in my opinion, they're doing, they're doing everything right. I mean, they've got, they've got top builder, celebrity, you know, judges, your, your Foos, your your Troy Trapan, your 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 Roadster Shop guys, your, you know, all the top builders are going to be there, um, mm-hmm. not only displaying cars but judging cars for these Triple Crown Awards. There's a um, like a a Muscle Car Award, there's a Hot Rod Award, and there's a Truck Award. And the winner gets this awesome trophy. It's a giant, you know, two foot tall billet, chrome plated, custom made, heavy trophy that was, you know, one of them 
the I think the hot rod one was designed by Eric Brockmeyer, who's a you know a renowned hot rod artist, um, you know design uh-huh. renderer, and then just all the logistics and all the things that they're doing are like really cool for for car enthusiasts and people are are you know lining up to be there already and we're we're many months out so Mm -hmm. it's it's pretty exciting it's going to be cool and um i'm going to be doing uh a couple little promo videos for them uh because i i want to be i want to help somehow it's just one of those things sure and um if we play our cards correctly we'll be able to have mr case as a guest here right on this very program Ooh, that'll be yeah. nice. And he can tell us all about the Triple Crown, as long as we don't veer off on all the rest of the... <laughs> <laughs> all the rest of the stuff. No kidding. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Yeah, so that uh, just to let anyone know who wants to read more about it, that website is triplecrownofrotting.com. Yes. Yeah, check it out. Go right there and check it all out. There's a video of Gary talking about it, and uh, you can hear it again from from the man himself. Did you Did you watch that video? (laughs) No, no, I just I I just stumbled on it, but I'm gonna. (laughs) He needed to get the message out there to uh, potential sponsors and people that had a bunch of questions about this. So he made this video himself, and it's like I don't know, twelve or thirteen minutes long because there's a lot of stuff in it. But it's uh-huh. really mostly Gary sitting on his desk telling, you know, like he's talking to you or I. I okay. mean, like the PG version of him, you know, talking to you or I. <laughs> 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 but those who know him are like, yeah, there he is. So uh, it's cool. <laughs> so I think at the very least, uh, like I said, a little little promo, maybe a guest appearance. And uh, as we record this, it's uh, it's towards the end of February. So the springtime is starting to kick off and, and the... Uh, uh-huh. The summer event season's already stacked up, and and um, it's cool. So this past weekend, um, I was doing a little garage after we got back from Cleveland. I was doing a little uh, garage cleaning, and I decided to uh, back the '70 Buick out of the garage to uh, to clean up the garage, and it didn't really want to start very well, mm-hmm. and it kind of aggravated me because it's one of those things where. I know it just needed a little attention and I just haven't had time to do it. So right. I said, you know what? We're going to take care of this. So it's got a street demon carburetor on it. And right. I backed it out into the sunlight and opened the hood and uh, took a look at it and took the carburetor off the car. And um, we had done some tuning on this thing a while ago with an air fuel meter for like part throttle and full throttle. So mm-hmm. the top end is dialed, but the choke was veering out of adjustment Mm. so uh, i noticed that the throttle blade um this is a type of carburetor that has transfer slots where it's a little you know slot at the base plate that allows just a little bit of air to come through into a circuit that blends idle and part throttle so it's it's like creating a little vacuum to just kind of start that throttle fuel happening in addition to the accelerator pump, if that makes sense. So hmm. when you're, you know, the way a carburetor works when you're idling, it's breathing through the idle circuit. And then right. as soon as you give it a little fuel, a little throttle, the plates open and then it stops breathing through the idle circuit and it starts breathing down the throat of the carburetor through the big mm-hmm. circuit. And sometimes you get a stumble there because there's a right. transition between switching from the idle circuit and the, you know, primary the circuit. The main metering circuit, right. Yeah. And they make these little slots in there, which kind of blend that little air signal, oh, if you will. Kind of like an off idle. Yeah, right. And yeah. if you don't have that adjusted right, you could be over-relying on the idle circuit or under-relying on the next one and... You know, blah, blah, blah. So that, it turns mm-hmm. out that was off a little bit. And if that's not right, it's going to throw off your fast idle adjustment. Mm. And it can also throw your choke off. And in this case, the timing was set to compensate for that. The timing was used to change the idle speed. So took the carb off, drained it, wiped it down, flipped it over, looked at those slots, started there, adjusted them to the proper, I don't know, 30,000s 
of an inch opening and then kind of gave it a little bit more uh, uh, fast idle, if you will, a little high idle setting and put it back on the car, lubed up the, the choke linkage real nice, uh-huh. made sure all that stuff was real smooth and uh, uh, put a vacuum gauge on it, started up and adjusted the uh, idle screws to where it had optimal, it had huge vacuum. This is a 39,000 mile, you know, 53 year old, completely stock engine that's never been apart. Mm. Good heavens. And it was making like almost 19 inches of vacuum. Really? At idle? Yeah, it was wow. crazy. 18 and a half. On a 70, 455. That's <laughs> crazy. On a 455, yeah, it was. It was. So I was like, wow. And, and typically what I like to do is tune that idle for the you know, most vacuum and then take, turn the screws back on the uh, idle mixture or on the uh, idle speed to, if the speed's too high. But this one, I knew I didn't want to mess with the, the idle speed because I just had set that for the transfer slot adjustment, uh-huh. which means that our idle speed was too high because of timing. So I retarded the base timing a little bit. Okay. And uh, took it for a cruise, and it uh, it pinged just a touch, so it still had a little too much um, timing in it. Still Pulled it back quick, another degree okay. or two. I, I sacrificed a little bit of vacuum, so now we're down to about 17 and a half inches, which is still like still insane. great, insane. Yeah, I'm out yeah. of vacuum, and now this thing starts before it does half a rotation. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, it's wonderful. So oh. choke linkage is buttery and it, it clicks into place, you know, the way it's supposed to. Uh, and it just got, you know, these things get gummed up or bent a little bit. And yeah. And, and what a lot of people don't realize today is modern cars, you know, they're so nice. You never, yeah. you never have to do anything like this. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. These cars, you had to do maintenance, periodic maintenance. Like yeah. Those choke linkages. Because I had this thing dialed exactly like this, you know, four years ago, and then I haven't looked at it since. Um, but if you look at, you know, how a carburetor works, there are little metal arms and rods that attach things to other things. And it, mm-hmm. as you put your throttle down, one thing pivots and it pushes on a, a little rod, which connects to another thing, which pulls on another rod. And, and all these things need to be in the proper sequence and, and the right amount. And you mm-hmm. adjust them literally by bending them. You're right. It's Isn't that very, wild? It is. Bend a tang, you know, to yeah. bend a rod. So you put a little feeler gauge in there for an adjustment, and then you bend it to match. Well, because you can bend them into place, they also unbend through use. Un- <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> and that, and yes, that's how they things do. start to change. And if they change, and the other mm-hmm. thing is the thing sits a while. You know, this car is not driven every day, so something might get mm-hmm. a little sticky or varnishy in there, and, and there you go. So it's, it can be frustrating to go, you know what? I just spent all this money on this carburetor, you know, two years ago, and mm-hmm. now i got to mess with it. Well, y- you do. Um, Congratulations. It's doing exactly what it's designed to. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but just be hopeful because if you take a minute and you know understand what everything's doing understand that if this pushes that and it pushes this and it's supposed to be this mm-hmm. much and the, it says this in the book and familiarize yourself it's like oh well here you go we need mm-hmm. a 30 second less opening size over there crank it back put it together you don't think it's going to make a difference a lot of times these little tiny adjustments right um uh, but show enough. <laughs> well, that's funny you mentioned that because um, on the GTO, you know, it's still using um, the divorced mechanical choke. And the choke rod, it came off of the choke stove, right? And it kind of lodged itself. So the, the butterfly, the choke butterfly, wouldn't fully open. Mm. And it was causing an amazing amount of drivability issues with that oh, car. Oh, you're stumbling and running rich. Oh, it was ridiculous. Coughing. Yeah. And once they fixed it, it was a whole new car again. It's crazy yeah. how, how that affects it. Yeah. It's just, you know, and that little choke stove is just a coil up spring and it just pushes right. up on that rod. And mm-hmm. it's like, I don't know, an ounce of pressure on the right. spring. It's, it's like, 
you're, you're collapsing it with your thumb going, this can't be doing anything. There's no way this does right, anything. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I went through the same thing on my van. I, uh, I had to, you know, we're dialing in one thing at a time, and, and um, the, the, the choke was giving me an issue. And uh, sure enough, I had to put a, a choke stove on it, just like you're talking about, that bolts on the manifold, and it heats up and uncoils the spring and opens up the, the choke valve. Yeah. And the original one didn't open up enough. It just was out of gas, you know, from being 43 years old. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, does that thing start fast. That thing starts faster than the Buick. I mean, I think that's wow. like 10 degrees, and boom, it lights. That's beautiful, man. It's almost weird. It's like as soon as you click the key, <laughs> it's running. It's like, wow, that is cool. That one still that has sounds- a little bit of a – it's got a stumble in it somewhere, though, right after – idol that i'm I'm still kind of chasing but uh, mm. we'll, we'll get there one thing at a time yep and just you're real methodical about it so that's that's good yeah so you have to be you, you can't will, change you six, six things at once or you'll you don't know which one worked or didn't right and then you're exactly start you don't know if you canceled something out you know the one thing you changed worked but the other thing you changed negated that yeah and i think we all remember those of us who have rebuilt carburetors in the past, the, you know, the, the first time you tear into a, a Holley or a Quadrajet, Quadrajets in particular, because you'd get the rebuild kit from your parts store, and it comes in a, a little square, like mini pizza box, yep. and it's wrapped in plastic, and in there are like 40 parts, and you need six of them. Because <laughs> right. they, they span every single Quadrajet that was ever made. And... The first thing you do is take the uh, the 50 million time photocopied instructions that come out of the box <laughs> that you can barely read, right? <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> These were fresh and crisp in, you know, 1968, and mm-hmm. they've just been copied and copied and copied and put in boxes and put in boxes. So now they're all kind of blurry and everything. And you throw those out, and then the perimeter of the little pizza box has a perforated... Uh, you know, seam in it that you tear off what are little gauges and little measurement tools that right. you use to set the opening of the choke and the distance of a yep. certain, you know, pull off yeah. rod set adjustment, float, level. float yeah. levels and all that stuff. Well, so you ignore all that too. And you tear <laughs> the thing apart and put the parts you think are supposed to have back together and then just kind of wiggle things around and go, yeah, it looks pretty good. And you put it on yeah, there and it's it great. runs runs worse than it did before you started (laughs) yeah you really have to look at the instructions and understand what you're doing because those tiny little adjustments man make all the difference well the even even though quadra jets all look alike they're they're very very different from from year to year um little minor changes have happened for for improvements Mm -hmm. and so a float pivot for a 67 quadrajet may not work for a 70 quadrajet because they made an improvement in i think like 69 mm-hmm. so that those things you have to be you know cognizant of when uh when when doing things like this that even though they look alike they're not the same right and that really speaks to finding one that was never torn apart right. and mismatched with the wrong stuff uh because if if the original parts are there, you can get it back to what it's supposed to be uh-huh. without knowing that, yeah, oh, look, it's the wrong float. or Because uh-huh. you know, all the pieces will interchange. They just won't work the same. Correct. So it was uh, nice to get that, that thing dialed in and, and took the rib for a drive. Haven't driven it, I don't think, since like a, uh, it's been three or four months since I drove this car. And, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, appreciating the joys of the battery tender, you know? Oh, uh, sure. Batteries are nice and topped off. I got it in my uh, my Galaxy sitting here in the garage. And, you know, every week or so, I just unplug. I only have one tender because uh, cause I'm a cheap person, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so Because I unplug I'm frugal. It from, that's it. I, I pull it off of one and plug it into the other one. And then I, a couple of days later, I'll pull it off the other one and stick it back on the first one. And, you know, it's got... <laughs> A set of alligator clips on each battery with a little, you know, trailer plug, it looks like, peeking out of the grill. And it's really easy to do. Nice. Just switch it over. There you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> ba- batteries are always happy and eager and ready to go. Nice. So, yeah. So, 
What is also very interesting is um, the answer to our trivia questions that people have been waiting on for so long. All right, Kev. So I asked you what the gentleman Jim was, and you came out of the gate hot that it's a GMC pickup uh, luxury package. Um, and pretty much, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So hey! ding, 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 ding. All right. Yeah, it could. Uh, you can get things like uh, power steering and mm. air conditioning. Oh, so posh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I uh, had like leather buckets with a center console. Cool. And it, was have you ever seen that? In... That is super rare. It is. I, yeah, I saw a picture yeah. of that. Yeah, it's killer. And it was in that black and gold color scheme. And for the bonus, I asked you what years it was available, and it was a 75 only. Uh, ah, uh, so model. close. But it was a square body, so you are right about that. So I said three and four, so yeah, eh, close enough. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Cool-looking truck with the long bed on there. I really dig it. It is cool. And what I thought was interesting when I first learned of those is my mind immediately went to, oh, look, it's a Smokey and the Bandit truck. <laughs> right on. <laughs> but it's not. It's before that. Yeah, and, it is. You know, that uh, black and gold color scheme, once again, was that one of our trivia questions? Where did, where did that come from? Mm, Should have been. I don't think so. Do you know where the black and gold, it was the inspiration for the band of Trans Am. The, the gentleman Jim was? No, the black and gold color scheme came from somewhere that was oh. the inspiration for the gentleman Jim and for the oh. Trans Am. Because you never saw black and gold before like 75, 74, 75. Yeah. No, that, I, I don't know what the inspiration was. It came from the Formula One team of the John Player Special. And now you can remember in your head the F1 car that was all black and it had gold pinstriping on it. And John Player was a cigarette brand in England. And it was called the John Player Special, promoted by a tobacco company. And Pontiac said, that's kick-ass. And they they took that color scheme for the Trans Am. Oh, I just brought a picture of it up there. That is cool. Oh, they were awesome. Yeah, yeah. Great looking car. One of the best looking... uh, Formula One paint schemes, I thought, ever. Without a doubt. Heck yeah. So there's a free trivia question with answer all at once. How about that? We are <laughs> givers and givers <laughs> and givers on this show. You knew you listened this far for a reason. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so I ask you, what does Testarossa mean? And your answer was, oh, for Pete's sake, Michael. <laughs> careful over there whoops uh and then you uh you threw out ah uh, heck it's gonna i'm just gonna throw this out there and i'm gonna say it's the word race car in italian mm-hmm. well sorry to say that's uh mm. not quite uh testarossa actually means redhead redhead Rosa is red. I'm guessing Testa means head. Gosh, and, uh, dang it to heck. The Ferrari. All right, so in 50, I don't, I don't know the first year, 56, 57, one of those two, I think. Um, their racing version of their uh, GT car was set apart in the fact that it had, a, I think, a 3-liter V12 that uh, the, the cam covers were wrinkle-coated red for the race version and they just called it a red head and there you go well heck yes pretty neat huh that is pretty neat that is pretty neat and i i believe i did know what that meant at one time but i just gosh dang it it wouldn't come to me well there was one hour when you were in italy you knew it yeah i'm sure yeah i'm sure there was some testarosas walking around just just (laughs) driving all over the flight line absolutely (laughs) well maybe there was some walking around Right. Some Ita- Italian oh, redheads. Oh, walking around. You know? some t- I got you. Hey, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Go. Yeah. Well, the Testarossa concept is an idea for another vehicle that's in my mind. And, I, uh, you know, for years I've been sitting on this list of, of awesome cars that I think would be killer to build. Mm-hmm. And, and it was like, 
I mean, the list is getting long, and some of them have coincidentally been built by other people just because the idea was there. It just organically mm-hmm. somebody else landed on it right. as as well. And and for a long time, I thought, you know what? I'm gonna I got to sit on these because I can't let these out. You know, if I let these out, <laughs> somebody else will build them. And then I can't be the second guy to build them. I got to be the first guy. Well, right. So now I'm I'm to the point. Well, I well yeah, we need to be the first the first guy to build this. So they, mm-hmm. they need to get out. So somebody goes, I dig that. You need to build that and, and let's work together on it. So, um, I'm going to, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. You know, maybe it's going to be a video or, you know, sharing some renderings of, you know, story time of fantasy car and, you know, click here if you want it and we'll figure out how to build it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I have, I finally, we just came through the, uh, AMBR America's most beautiful roadster, season at the grand national right. roadster show in california and i i've always loved that competition i love those cars but i never really thought i had a, a dog in the fight to be able to enter into something like that with the right idea and then it happened Ooh! it was only a week ago that the idea kind of came into my mind of of something that i think would be because it to compete over there it's got to be not just build quality it's got to make sense and it, the car part choices and fabrication and how it all fits together somebody has to look at it from across the room and go oh check that out and then get up close and go oh damn you're right right that and then later on go oh now it all makes sense because Mm. you know and i I think i have that idea so oh nice well yeah don't don't tell us yet yeah, no, and that's where I'm at. It's yeah. like, well, do I tell you? It's not like somebody else is going to build this thing tomorrow and then go win the AMBR. <laughs> what do I do? I say, well, I, I should have won that, but I don't have the trophy right now anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, that's my trophy, bro. <laughs> yeah, that was my idea, pal. <laughs> you, go, you, you owe me that trophy. Did you patent it? Did you own it? Does it have your name on it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So for the... The spirit of the idea getting out there so that anybody can share it and enjoy it because everybody should see these. I'm just shifting my focus and I'll, I'll just start presenting them willy nilly. Right on. And hopefully we get the nod to build them because uh, they came from a lot, a lot of, you know, thought and experience and gestalt moments like that one I had last week when I went, ah, oh, there you go. That's it. There it is. Well, good. Let's make it happen. Heck yeah. Working on it. All right, man. Well, I'm, I'm learning that our uh, our three-day visit to Cleveland really took a lot out of me. And uh, I'm, st- <laughs> I'm st- still recovering. Right. Thank you to the Same. fine people of Cleveland and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and a whole slew of, of dive bars and tiki bars and <laughs> oh, other places. Boy. And uh, our good friend, Mr. Gary Case, for, uh, for hanging out with us because it was a lot of fun. I recommend it. Yeah, and our good friend, Mr. <coughs> for uh, putting it together for us. Heck yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was really a nice treat. Yep. For sure. All right, well, that's all I got, man. Yeah, that is all I have as well. All right, well, we appreciate you hanging with us. Uh, you know, we've started doing a little more uh, promotion on this show, we're dropping a little 30-second clip here and there. Uh, we're getting a lot more people that are discovering our podcast. So if you just recently have, welcome. Uh, click that subscribe button and, uh, you know, you'll get the opportunity to play along with our next silly trivia game. And uh, <laughs> that's pretty much all I got, man. Yeah, man. Good times. Always a good time. So keep your eye on uh, vhspeedshop.com for new updates on the uh, machine shop. And uh, for Mr. Mike Cuball clark I'm Kevin Oste, reminding you, <laughs> the phrase just came into my head from when I was in grade school where the, the kids used to pick on the other one saying, I'd rather be dead than have red on my head, but I don't think that's true anymore. <laughs> <So> <laughs> we'll see you next time on VA Radio. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs>